afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us on camera for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And by the end of this month, never really have done more programs than this month. I think I think we're approaching the 70 mark. It's been a little bit crazy, but I really appreciate all of you teachers for joining us as we continue to showcase and celebrate such amazing people and places around the globe. Now, this month has been chock-a-block full of themed weeks and, and times. We are doing space months, so we're doing astronauts, NASA engineers, roboticists, and more. We did our epic secret path week with indigenous speakers from across Canada. We launched the Ingenious Plus campaign, encouraging you guys to submit your innovations for $10,000 cash prizes. Whew, it's been busy. So frankly, it's really nice to dive in with an independent program with a special group that's joined us a few times with some really top-notch programming in the past. And that is the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory. So this is a special place, not just in Canada, but in the world, a place where they do amazing research and work to uh, understand bird migrations across the continent in a really, really special place for doing so. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl, part of their amazing program, who's gonna tell us a little bit about what they all do. And then technology, willing so far so good we're going to dive in with philip to do a bit of a live bird banding so cheryl thank you so much for joining us today and my pleasure away. thank <laughs> you for inviting us all you right are. so did you want me to start right away with the slides yeah you're you're all set to go i've got it up on slide number oh, one it's beautiful all right all right so my name's cheryl and i'm with the prince edward point bird observatory's naturehood program and today we're going to be looking at migratory bird banding so prince edward point bird observatory or petlo runs a scientific research station, which is a special laboratory for studying birds of a sort. And we study all sorts of birds. We look at large birds like this Cooper's hawk and this barred owl, as well as mid-sized birds, the passerines, the songbirds and perching birds, uh, the little sawa owls as well are come into that category, some beautiful birds. And we also look at small birds like warblers, nuthatches, more warblers and chickadees, sparrows, finches, more warblers, lots and lots of small birds, and even very tiny birds, like this little ruby-throated hummingbird female. So what do all of these birds have in common? They migrate. They move from one habitat or region to another according to the season, and it can be a long and dangerous journey for these birds. So let's take a look at where these birds are going. So here's a map with North America, Canada, the US and South America down here, Mexico. We're looking at North America because that's the birds that we study at Petbo. I, I understand some of you are further afield and you do have the same migratory type routes in your area. They're around the, the globe. So why do birds migrate? In the fall, this time of year, they're flying south for food. Most birds can tolerate the cool weather, but they can't last without food. And in the cold, there's no insect for the birds to eat. So those birds must find food. So they migrate south. In the spring, they're looking for breeding territory and more space. So they're going in which to raise their family. So they're going to come north looking for space to have a family. And many are heading to the Canadian boreal forests or the boreal forests in Russia and, and Europe and China. So this is where they're headed into this big green forest. So Canada has 30% of the world's boreal forest. It's a big responsibility for us to protect that habitat for the birds and for ourselves as well. Let's see where we are. So I know we have a school group from, Bank, from British Columbia rather, and you're on the uh, Western Flyway. So you're getting birds from the Arctic and the boreal forest north of you coming south along the, the Western side of the continent. And way over on the far side, I know we have school group, schools from South Carolina, and you're in this Eastern Flyway, which is like a bird highway. And your birds are coming from Quebec and um, Northern Canada and flying down through your area into the islands. And some of the birds are actually staying with you for the winter because you're far enough south for that. And in fact, there was a small bird captured by one of your banding stations in South Carolina uh, last spring. It was a little junco, a member of the sparrow family. And uh, it had been banded by Petbo two years earlier. So we know that from that one incident, we know that juncos travel from Canada to South Carolina and they live for at least three years. So this is the sort of information we're getting with our bird banding 
uh, research. And we have some students from Texas. And Texas, you have big responsibilities. You've got three different flyways coming through your state. And the birds are coming from way up in the Arctic and the boreal forests, making that journey. And some of them are making the longest journeys down into deep into South America. So birds stopping in your state to recover and rest and feed and get ready to go uh, need your protection and help. And again, you're far enough south that some birds are staying with you for the winter. So big responsibilities there for helping birds by making spaces available for them. And Ontario, way up here, you've got a big chunk of that boreal forest to protect. And you also have a huge area of urban density and urban areas and birds um, don't always get along so well. It's not a great place for birds. So our challenge in Ontario is to find ways to make our urban areas safer for birds having to migrate through those areas to get to their southern destinations. And then again, to the north. We've got a lot of buildings that light up and are in their way and are dangerous for them. Now, where is Petbo or Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory on this picture? Right up here, right in the middle of a flyway. And in fact, Petbo is at the bottom of Ontario here, right on the shores of Lake Ontario. So the birds are coming south this time of year. They come to the shoreline of the lake. This area right in here is the only undeveloped shoreline on the north shore of Lake Ontario. So it's a quiet place where they can feed and rest. And then it's also a short crossing if they use these islands to come across so they can continue their journey down through the United States. So Petbo is right here the very tip of that and we experience a wide variety of birds coming through so it makes us an ideal place to monitor migrating birds. So we've looked at who we're studying, we're studying migrating birds, the smaller birds, the passerines, the warblers and finches and things and where they're coming from and where they're going to and now we're going to look at what it is that we're doing with banding. So a, a bird's band looks like this they're little aluminum bands. These are for the, the song smaller birds. They're lightweight, so it's like wearing a watch. These bands are a little bit larger than a pencil eraser, which I have here as an example. Each band has a unique number. So when a bird is banded, that bird can now be identified by number, and no other bird will have the same number. And we put the band on this section of the leg so that it can't go off over the foot or go up over the knee, but it can move around loosely like a bracelet so it's not too tight and it won't fall off the bird so that when the bird is recaptured, the band will still be there. So that's what a bird band looks like. And now we're gonna see how we get that little band on that tiny leg in a good way. So this is the job that the banders are doing at the bird observatory. So here's our lab. And we're gonna take a look at how, a day at the observatory and see how we get those bands on. So the day starts very, very early at sunrise. We put out net, mist nets and ground traps to catch the birds through the day, through the morning rather. And because we're out in a national wildlife area, there are very few people around, so it's quiet. The birds feel safe and they feed and move around in our forest quite readily. Here you see our lab and the cottage where our banders stay for the migratory season. They're there for the spring season and the fall season only at the bird observatory. Here. So we can see here some of the different types of bands that are used, all different sizes and shapes. We band all sorts of birds and birds are given a little code name, a four letter code name to make it easier to identify them. So this A-M-R-O is American Robin. Birds are different sizes, so bands are different sizes. In each one of these containers is a different size band labeled by number and letter. These pliers are what we use to put the bands on and we're gonna see those in action a little later on in this video clip. We put our nets up in different habitats. So we have new growth forests where we put nets. We have shoreline areas. We have grasslands. And that's our banders heading out to gather birds. We have some older forests, mature forests. We have wetlands. Each habitat means we find different types of birds. So here's a mist net. 
it's up about 10 to 12 feet and very fine netting. It's right here and you can't see it. And that's the idea, the birds don't see it either. So here's Philip, our bandering charge you'll meet later. He's extracting a bird from the net. And this is our assistant bandering charge, Jessica. She's blowing to help separate feathers so she can see where the, the lines of the net are. And this is a little junco, a bird that was in South Carolina, that type of bird that Philip's extracting. And you can see how loose the nets are and soft. So when the birds hit them, it's a gentle roll into that pocket. And then they wait for us to extract them. So we're seeing a chickadee coming out of the net here. Just untangling the little feet. Chickadees are feisty, so they put up, they try and, and fight back a little bit. And each bird goes into a cotton bag that allows them to breathe. They feel safe in there and they're and it's there's no hard corners or anything to arm them. And then you'll see Philip here putting a clothes peg on the bag. That identifies which net or trap the bird was captured in. And now the birds are headed back to the, the lab so we can process them and give them their band. Because we're a research facility, we're tracking all the data. So we record the weather for the day, the time of day, the net. Um, all of that information is recorded as part of the research. The birds are first weighed while they're still in the bag. And we zero out the weight of the basket and bag so that we get just the weight of the bird. The birds are all lined up, each one in its own bag. And the bags are, we can launder those regularly so that they're clean and safe for the birds. And you can see the identifying tags for each net. And then these ones are all captured from this line back using this tag number. This little bird was already banded uh, so they'll, if it was banded that very same day or the day before, the bird would be released immediately so that it's not in captivity for too long. If it's been a few days, they will measure and weigh the bird again to see what changes have occurred. And usually they've gained a gram or two of fat and getting ready to finish their migration. So this is a little yellow warbler. And how do we tell if a bird is fat? We blow on the feathers to separate them. We can see the skin. And underneath the skin, we can see the fat. Their skin is quite thin and translucent. And we give the fat a rating between zero and seven. Seven being a very plump bird that's got lots of fat energy for making its journey south or north, depending on the season. And then the birds are released to continue their journey. And you can see here some birds rest peacefully. Other birds think maybe there's a chance they could get away. The first thing we do after weighing the bird and removing it from the bag is to put a band on it so that if a bird does escape, at least we know the type of bird and the band number. And then once we've got the band on, we can start collecting the rest of our data. So we can see our scribe here. So the bird is weighed and then we begin the process again of measuring the bird. So this little bird wears a size one band Philip doesn't have to measure the leg every time for every bird because he's banded so many birds. He knows this type of bird wears this size of band. There goes the band on the leg. And now he's examining the feathers to help determine the age of the bird. He's looking for that fat. He's measuring the wing. The wing length can help determine whether it's a male or a female, depending on the species of bird. Some birds the males and females look exactly the same and it's the wing length that can help determine whether it's male or female. And then the bird is released on its way. We try to release the birds within 40 minutes and we check the nets every 20 minutes for birds. So here's Jessica examining very closely the wing on the bird for the growth, uh, for the pattern of feathers, the new growth of feathers and the wear and color of the feathers. That helps decide the age of the bird. There are first year birds and then there are mature birds. Of, um, we don't know whether they're two years, three years, four years. We just know they're more than one year. Our scribe is often a volunteer, enters all of the information into the computer. And that information goes to a database, the Canadian um, Migration Monitoring Network and the US United States Geological Survey are two databases where our information is stored for scientists to make use of. So the bags are going into the laundry there. 
and we're getting ready to band another bird. You can see the big open window that we can let the birds out. And you can see how neat and tidy our banders keep their workstations so that it's well organized and clean so that the birds are safe and they can work efficiently and, and get those birds out the window as quickly as possible. Jessica's checking the tail feathers here for wear and fading. That will help determine the age of the bird as well. And that's an oven bird she has in her hand there with his little orange cap. More birds arriving. Every 20 minutes, their volunteers are out uh, gathering birds from the nets as well as the banders so that we can get them processed and out as quickly as possible. So you'll see that at the very end of the pliers, the band was in that hole in the pliers so that when the band is closed around the leg, it can't crush the leg. And checking the feathers very carefully for wear. And you can see how relaxed this vireo is, red-eyed vireo is. He's just sitting there waiting for an opportunity to escape, but he's not in any discomfort. And there, this is called the wing cord, measuring the length of the wing, checking for fat again. You saw the pink skin there. Philip's checking the age of a chickadee, and Jessica has a sparrow that she'll be examining. And now Mr. Chickadee gets to head out on his journey. Well, chickadees do stay. Some migrate further south. They don't go very far because they can eat seeds and other things. And some stay in the county and in northern Ontario, northern areas as well for the winter. So Jessica's put the band on the peg of the pliers and he's opening it. And then the band goes into the hole of the pliers. And she holds the leg firmly so it can't move and closes the band around the leg and then checks the feathers for age. This is a little kinglet, one of our tiniest birds. Next is the uh, hummingbird for small. Birds lose their feathers to help uh, escape predators, so they loosen their feathers. And that's a day at the banding lab. We operate from sunrise for about six hours, so by midday the nets are then closed up for the afternoon. Uh, in the fall, we put up a different set of nets in the evening to capture small uh, sawwet owls, and we ban those as well. And occasionally we catch larger owls also. Um, the banding lab is so far from out that we have no power lines because we're on solar power. We also take photographs of the birds that we capture, uh, different species, not every bird, of course, but when we capture something different or particularly uh, gorgeous specimen and we'll take photos of them for our records. So that's a day at the Bird Observatory. Our data goes to uh, support research. Researchers can then access our information and as we saw with the, the Junko in South Carolina, it gives us information about where the birds are and how long they've been living and what they're doing out there. Uh, the research tells us what's changing in the world because birds travel the world, it gives us a bigger picture. We could study field mice, and that will tell us what's happening in the field, but not the whole world. So that's why birds are such a good subject for study. When we understand what's changing on our planet, it helps us decide what actions that we could take to fix the planet. <laughs> and the ability to conserve is limited, so we have to know where the greatest need is so we can focus our limited resources on those important areas. And are there things that you can do to help? By all means, as a student, you can be a bird watcher. We protect what we know. So learning about birds will give you ideas on ways to help birds. The number one cause of death for birds are cats. So keeping your cat indoors can save a lot of birds. The second cause of death is collision with man-made structures. So putting some decals on your windows on the outside of your window can help limit, uh, minimize bird window strikes for birds. Make spaces around you bird friendly, put out food and water for birds and join, join a conservation group in your community. It helps you find others with ideas and we do better when we work as a group uh, on projects to help preserve and conserve our planet. So thank you for your attention to the slides. I hope that that was, gave you some information and maybe inspired some questions uh, for Philip, who's up next. So over to you, Jesse, for Philip.
Thank you so much, Cheryl. What a fantastic presentation. If you want to exit it and come back to us, perfect. Uh, I'll turn it over to Philip to show us what live bird banding looks like, and then we'll dive in with questions which are already pouring in. Philip, take us away, man. Hello. All right. So Jess just came back with uh, a round of birds. So as you can see, they're hanging up right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a bird, and we're going to start with a bird that everybody's going to recognize, or at least most people will anyways. So like you saw in the video, I'm going to zero the scale and weigh the bird. I'm going to pull it out very slowly. So this is a really big bird, and so I'm just going to pull him out. And there we go, he's grabbing onto the bag. There we go. So as you can see, a blue jay. So these, these guys are very, very aggressive when they're in the hand, even though we're used to seeing them in feeders and stuff like that. So these guys take a size two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a band from this side. So as you can see here, we have this little band on. It's gonna have the right number. So I'm just gonna confirm the number. And it is band number 28, which is appropriately the next band in our series of bands. So I'm opening it up with the pliers here. Um, kind of like this to open it up here and I have the open space here. I'm gonna put it in the end of the plier. So this first hole here is the hole that we use for our actual um, size twos. And then I'm gonna support the leg of this bird like this, bring the pliers in, turn them on the bird and close the, pli the pliers onto the bird's leg like this. And so now when I have the band on the bird, I'm just making sure that it can rotate, goes up and down and now I know that a bird is banded and safely banded as well. When we're looking to age these birds, what we're looking at is we're looking at their wing. And so this guy, in this case, we see that there's barring in its uh, greater coverts here. So these are the feathers right above the flight feathers. And the barring is only halfway along its greater coverts. So the barring doesn't go all the way to the end here where my index finger is. So that indicates to us that this bird is a younger bird. So I know that this bird is young and then I'm going to enter that into our data. And then I'm going to measure its wing cord. So like you saw in the video, we take this and we're going to put it just resting on the wing ruler gently. It has a wing of 130. And then I'm going to put this ruler down. Now I'm going to blow for fat. And this guy has a little bit of fat. So we know that he has a one fat. So now we know that the blue jay has one fat. Swing is 130, it's a young bird, and it weighs 83.9 grams. So not a very heavy bird, even though they're pretty large birds and are considered one of our medium slash larger birds that will band. So now he's fully processed. So we'll be able to actually release him and let him go. And that'll be it for this bird. Oh. And now we're gonna do another bird. If you want, we can do one more. And then, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna do one more bird and we're gonna do a brown creeper. So again, I zero the scale and I'm gonna take this bird out of the bag like this. And so we identify the bird first. So I know what this bird was because Jess told me. So this is a brown creeper, very small bird with a nice curved bill. And they take our smallest band size, so they're going to take a 0A. So compared to that Blue Jay band, we have this really tiny one, so barely visible in my fingers like this. So I'm going to use a different set of pliers. This time we're using ones that have a smaller pin on it. And I'm going to open up the band the same way. Just a little bit enough for it to get onto the bird's leg. So again, I'm going to support the bird's leg like this, bring the band in rotate it onto the bird's leg and then close it. And then again, we make sure that the band rotates and goes up and down the bird's leg. So now that I know that this bird is banded, I'm going to look at its wing for its age. And with all this, the plumage on this bird is harder to use to age than a blue jay. It's based a lot on its white spots and this guy has very small white spots. So we know that this bird is an older bird. And then I'm going to take its wing ruler again to measure its wing where its wing is 64. And then and we're gonna blow on it for fat. And this guy has three fat, so he's getting ready to move on. So he'll be very, very good to go soon. And uh, yeah, so this bird is now banded. Looks very big on screen, but uh, 
fits very small in the palm of our hands. And it weighs 7.9 grams, so just about eight grams, so not very much. Uh, but now that this bird is processed and ready to go, I'm gonna release him to minimize the amount of time we hold the birds. Okay. And that was it for all of our current banding. Oh, so, so cool. I always love the opportunity to do this, and it's so nice to have two such distinct birds. Cheryl mentioned in the chat, too, for people that were curious, Blue Jay weighs a little bit more than the average chocolate bar, uh, which in, in lieu of Halloween coming up very soon uh, is a very fitting metaphor. Uh, guys, we're going to dive in. We've got a bunch of questions already on YouTube, so for our live class, put on those thinking caps, and we'll see if you guys have any queries as well. Uh, Cheryl, by all means, if you'd like to pop back in as well, we can take answers from both you and Philip jointly. But our first question, Miss Wen's class, they're in Vancouver, and they want to know what bird you catch the most. So, Philip, we've got to see two birds today. Is there, like, a, a main bird? Okay, so we have a lot of birds that we catch a lot of. Um, this fall specifically, our most banded bird is actually the ruby-crowned kinglet, where we've banded 1,188 of them so far. So that could be a lot. Um, it could be a lot compared to other birds. Um, but in retrospect, like we've banded 8,875 birds so far this fall, and the 1,200 of them about were ruby-crowned kinglets which is like a five and a half gram bird. So not very heavy. Do you ever sleep? I was thinking it would be like in the hundreds maybe, but that's ridiculous. So is this, out of curiosity, is this like an uncommon amount of birds or do you always have this many over a fall? That's crazy. Well, so so per fall, eventually, like we'll get about like five to 6,000 birds um, per fall. But this fall we're doing very, very well. And we've had a lot of birds. Uh, so, you know, because we're close to 9,000. In terms of ruby crown kinglets specifically, we've actually had on average about 600 of them per season. So we've almost doubled that right now. You know, we have had a big year of ruby crown kinglets at 1,241, but uh, so far at almost 12,000. 1200 we're doing very very well with them <laughs> this year specifically i could i could have follow-ups all day long but we want to make sure kids get questions that's why we're here so let's head to miss ross's class do you guys want to kick us off with a question uh come on up you're good to go hey guys um my question is how old is the oldest bird you've caught hmm so the oldest bird that we've ever caught um i have ever caught specifically would be an 11 year old blue jay so um, it was a bird that we caught here, actually, and it was recaptured from year to year and so on until one year we caught it again and uh, had been 10 years. Since then, we haven't really caught an older bird than that, but uh, there has been birds at the observatory that were 13 years old as well. Very cool. Great question. And thanks for joining in from Tavistock, guys. Let's head to Sarnia now. Mr. Tanner's class joining us for the first time in a live camera spot. Take us away with a question. Just unmute that mic and you're good to go. Hi, but unmute, unmute, we want to hear you. More fun that way. Everyone can unmute, there you go. Hey guys, welcome in. Hi. Hi. Hello. Uh, ours is a two part question. We wanted to know, do you catch birds from other banding sites? And do you share the information with them and they with you? So actually, uh, we do catch birds from other banding sites. One of the most like shared birds, quote unquote, would be the Northern Sawat Owl. So that's a program that we do at night when we're catching owls. And uh, recently we've gotten three updates from a station in Ontario and two stations in New York that have caught our owls that we have banded this year. And so all of that information gets submitted to the bird banding office that is like conjoined with um, the all the entire continent. So that's all of North America, Canada, US and Mexico. And any bird that's banded there and gets reported to um, the bird banding offices in the respective countries, uh, we're able to tell where that bird was banded. So all of our information is very much connected and shared. So we know immediately when we catch birds from other stations and vice versa. Also, whenever we catch a bird that is our own, it'll come up in our system as like our bird banded because we have our own band numbers because every bird band is unique. And then, so when we have a bird number that we don't recognize or that isn't picked up by our computer, then we can tell that this bird is from a different station and we can submit that information to figure out where we actually caught that bird. 
We've had particle physicists on, astronauts, and now bird banders. And the one unifying theme of all of them is the global and collaborative nature of science. I'm so glad we got that question, Mr. Tanner. Thank you guys so, so much. All right, Miss Folks class, Pear Tree Elementary, I want to come to you and see if we can get that audio working. Uh, so unmute your mic, and then if not, I'll take it from the chat. But you should be good to go, in theory. Hi. We're wondering. Oh, you got the double device thing on. That's okay. So, hey, we'll say hi, and what I'll do is I'll take your question from the chat bar. So, uh, what's the biggest bird you caught in Banda? We get all the pearl this year, so go for it. Okay, so this year, the biggest bird that we've caught so far has been the barred owl. So, a barred owl is an owl that um, doesn't migrate a lot, but it does move around a lot. And since we do our Sawit program, barred owls actually hunt the northern Sawit owl. So when they hear our call that we use to attract the northern Sawit owls, they'll come here and they'll get trapped in our nets. So we've actually caught four barred owls so far this year, which is like a pretty good number, I would say, for an owl uh, that we caught this year. And they take a 7B in terms of band size, and the band sizes go all the way up to nine. So we're pretty much almost at the biggest bird that we could band here. Very, very cool. Thanks, guys. I'm sorry for the audio stuff, but that was great. Uh, let's head to Chalk River, Ontario for Mr. Shannon's class. Come on up, guys, and nice to see you again. Hey, everybody. What bird bites the most? Who? <laughs> Which bird what? Bites the most? Bites the most, yeah. What bird savaging your fingers, Phil? Okay, the bird that has hurt my fingers the most has probably been woodpeckers or a northern shrike. So northern shrikes are what we call butcher birds, and what they do is they actually um, attack birds, and then they spike them onto twigs, and then they use the really nice uh, hooked bill to, like, rip off their flesh. And so when you're trying to get them in a photo, like I was showing you guys when I was presenting the bird in the photograph, um, what they do is they just, like, start biting at this part of your hand. So that's the bird that's uh, bitten me the most. Um, but I would say a lot of birds like to bite, um, but that's definitely the one that's hurt the most. <laughs> Oh, by the way, I, I love that you're telling this like gruesome story about yourself and you're still so enthusiastic about it. I love biology nerds like us where it's like, oh yeah, they just grab things and they impale them on some spikes. Uh, it's brutal, but very, very cool. Everyone should look up shrikes when you're done this program. And I would imagine a woodpecker would be a close second. That's not a, yeah. Um, all right, guys, we're whipping through these. This is great. I'm going to head back to Mrs. Ross's class for another question. So come on up, guys, and you're, you're good to go. Uh, hi. Uh, I was wondering why birds like boreal forests so much. So the reason birds like the boreal forest so much is because because it gets so cold here in the winter, um, the, the boreal forest doesn't have a lot of predators. So that means like not many things can live there year round. And since birds are able to fly really long distances in a short amount of time compared to like um, any of our land animals, you know, like snakes and uh, mammals and um other rodents and so on. Um, because of that, they don't migrate as much or as far. Therefore, the predators for these birds have not been able to come all the way this far up north. Another reason for the reason they like the boreal forest is because the season, the summer is so short, all of these birds have actually um, learned that the boreal forest explodes in nutrients and food so quickly. So like, uh, like Cheryl was saying, like mosquitoes, um, or like, I guess today we were talking about it, but um, mosquitoes have a peak season where they come out and hatch for the first time. And so a huge number of mosquitoes show up and a lot of birds like mosquitoes, which is great for us because they protect us from them. And um, so it's great for them and they love the boreal forest. So it's easy food, lots of space and um, no predators. So that means they're able to breed nice uh, without being attacked and so on. So they're able to survive and have a lot of babies. And then all they have to do is migrate, which is the toughest part of their journey. Oh, this is great. I love uh, the theory. great answers and great questions. Um, Mr. Tanner's class, come on back up. Unmute that mic again. And uh, we are all set to go. <laughs> um, if you band the bird too tight, how do you get it off? Uh, if we put a band on this too tight? Um, if we do that, uh, then the way we use it is we actually have special pliers for that. Uh, I can find them. So it doesn't happen very often because we're very sure of the bands that we put on. So we have um, these kinds of pliers here that instead of opening the way we opened them before, all we do is we squeeze them like this and it squeezes open like that. So we just have to slide it into the bird's leg and then squeeze it open so that we can uh, take the band off. But the bands and the pliers specifically are made to actually close the bands exactly perfectly onto the bird without it overlapping 
or being too tight onto the bird. So as long as we know what band size they take and we make sure anybody with that experience makes sure that they look it up before putting a band on a bird, uh, then we're able to do it pretty safely. I'm really glad you mentioned that experience, Ben. I mean, you've done this literally thousands of times as evidenced by this season alone, uh, but it's really worth noting that someone off the street can't just come and put a band on a bird. It's important to know your limitations when it comes to interacting with animals. People really shouldn't be going to pick up birds in general. Uh, there are many professional groups all across, certainly Ontario, Canada, the world, that uh, there are people like Philip that are able to do that in a, in a safe way to make sure that the bird is good by the end. So. Cool question, guys. All right, Miss Folks class, I know your audio isn't working. I'll bring you on to say a quick hello. Um, hello. And then you're Hi, guys. Welcome in. Oh, nice chair setup. So they have a question for you, Philip. What is your favorite bird? No pressure at all. You were going to get this. No. Nope. That's a super easy question to answer. My favorite bird is the great crested flycatcher. So it's like a very large flycatcher. And um, they make these like nice high-pitched like scream sounds that are kind of sweet to hear um but my favorite part about them is they have this nice crest on their heads and so and their color um like dynamics i guess are super cool because they have that like green head with like the gray throat and then they have a yellow belly an orange tail and a green back as well so like it all kind of looks just really nice and aesthetically pleasing to the eye so i think that's like a really cool looking bird and then just their attitude is just the best kind of thing and they travel in family groups which is really cool so you'll see like the mother and father kind of um leading their babies around kind of showing them how to catch flies because what fly catchers do is they perch on a branch and then they'll fly into the sky catch a bug and then come back to the same branch and so you'll see them kind of teaching their uh young birds how to do that and i think that's something that's really cool to see and they just look cool, they sound cool, and they have a nice attitude, so ends up being my favorite bird. You are one of the only biologists ever to come on and actually have a favorite animal, so thank you for that. Most people really waffle, and they're like, oh, the 10 are my favorite, but uh, it's nice to have one that really jumps out, so I hope all our classes can look those up and hopefully see them in person uh, in the not-too-distant future. Mr. Shattuck, come on in and wrap us up. Time flies and you're having fun. If you guys have one last question to end off the broadcast, you're good to go. Um, what is the smallest bird you guys caught? The smallest bird that we've caught? Yeah, yeah. Philip, uh, yes, smallest bird that you've caught. This Okay. The smallest bird that we've caught is uh, the hummingbird. So we've actually caught quite a few hummingbirds, but because hummingbirds take a specific permit to actually put a ban on them, we haven't banded them yet. I've banded a few hummingbirds, but this station specifically <clears throat> has not actually acquired that permit yet. Uh, but we have caught a lot of hummingbirds and um, a lot of them, they fit exactly like this in my hand. So they'll probably weigh about as much as this um, clip here. And we, we literally have to hold them like this between our fingers so that their little wings don't get out of our hands because oftentimes our hands are too big to actually hold them in the bander script. So the smallest bird that we've caught was the hummingbird. And it's a, uh, apart from that, the actual, the kinglets are the next size up. So golden crown and ruby crown kinglets are the next smallest birds that we'll catch. So, and we've banded um, over 2000 of them so far. So it's great. Very cool. I'm gonna bring Cheryl back on screen. She's got a band for a hummingbird to show. So. There so go. got it right there on the end of my finger is the tiny band for a hummingbird. Very, very cool. Thank you for that. This is I love these double presentations. You guys do such a good job. Um, I lied. I'm going to bring up one more student, Miss Ross's class. There's a student with a hand up right on the screen. So uh, come on up. Hey, Miss Ross's class, go for it. Yep. Okay, I have two questions. Okay, go the for it. Is, how many birds do you ban a year? And what's the second? You can ask both at the same time. The second one is, what is the most dangerous bird you ca you captured in? <laughs> nice. Ooh. Okay, so uh, on average per year, we'll ban about ten, about ten thousand to twelve thousand birds. Um, this year, we're already at twelve thousand. Uh, one second, I can actually tell you in a moment. But yeah, so on average, we'll ban about that. It also depends on how the weather is going. Because, uh, yeah, so we're at 12,612 birds so far this year. But depending on how the weather goes, so like uh, birds need north winds in the, in the fall to migrate south and south winds in the spring to migrate north. And so depending on the weather, it depends on how many birds are actually going to land at the point. Sometimes if the weather is so good, the birds will just skip right over the point and won't land here. And sometimes if the weather, weather is so bad, birds won't actually make the journey and they, or they won't survive when migrating. So 
depending on that, it'll depend how many birds we'll catch. But uh, we had a pretty good spring and we're having an amazing fall. So we're already up to 12,500 birds, which is a lot more than we would typically catch in a year. And then the most dangerous bird that we've caught has been definitely the barred owl. Um, like their size implies, like they are very big birds and they are an owl, therefore they are predators and they use really, really sharp talons to actually uh, attack birds. I can show you. Of course there's a problem, of course. <laughs> we have this skull here, uh, not this skull, this like, um, this, I guess, skeleton. Uh, and these talons here on a live bird are often trying to grab at you like this. And if they get inside your hand, it's often very hard to get them out without hurting yourself a lot. So um, that's the most dangerous bird we've caught. And there's just a very special way to hold them where we have to hold them exactly by their feet so that they can't actually grab onto you and hurt you when you are banding them. Very, very cool. What a, a pair of talons on that thing. And in fact, Cheryl has uh, some big owls uh, standing behind her too that are stuffed. I'm like, oh, and I'm and a prop too. Everybody, look at that thing. Seriously, like this is okay. I mean, we know that it's the case with blue jays and all the little birds. That it's important to have training, but it's really important to have training when it comes to something like that. Like just right through. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol Phillip, this has been so so much fun. What I want to do is encourage all our classes to go to pepco.ca to learn more about the amazing work you guys are doing. Uh, such a pleasure to have you both on. And uh, yeah, is there one last message? If kids want to keep the learning going, we have the website up. Is there anywhere else we can send them to to keep everything going, Cheryl? Um, Bird Studies Canada has uh, some good resources, and they also have some interactive maps. eBird has uh, ways to track migration. You can actually see from citizen scientists reporting their sightings. You can see the birds moving south and moving north, and that's a really cool thing to, to tap into. Yeah, fill up anything to add, mm -hmm. or those the best too. Yeah, I mean, just visiting any like kind of observatory that's around that's open to the public is fantastic because like there's observatories all around the world, and you know, oftentimes just looking up kind of different areas where birds are being banded, just looking up kind of like synonyms for banding, and usually you'll find an observatory that's usually pretty close by. So visiting those and getting live like in person conversations and like meeting wildlife is just something that's super invaluable and kind of really sticks with you kind of the way that I first learned it when I really wanted to work with wildlife so it was Fantastic. great well, you know obviously nothing beats being in person but I really appreciate you both taking the time to be here with us virtually you've inspired so many kids from across Canada the U.S. and beyond and so what we do at the end of every broadcast as you both know having joined me before is I'm going to bring in all our teachers to say a big thank you and farewell Miss Ross, Mr. Tanner, Miss Folk, Mr. Shattuck, if you guys want to join me, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everybody.